from my heart a little bit. And the question that I have for you is when we look at our lives and we're seeing things in our lives, we know that there's a nature of Christ, right? We know that there's a nature of God, and then we know that there's, there's the things of this world, there's the nature of the enemy, of our soul. But I have a question for you. Do you know what this means? I'm going to read a verse to you. I want you to just kind of, so if you have your Bibles, open up your Bibles. And we're going to go into the book of, of uh, John. And so somebody turn to, actually, let's, uh, before we go to John, let's go to Psalms 32. 32 verse 5. And so we're going to look at that. Joel, maybe when you, you, you have it, or, or somebody, if you have Psalms 32 verse 5, can you just go ahead and read it? So Psalms. So I just want you to read that again, Sister Forrest. Go ahead and read that, Psalms 30, 35, verse 2 again. 35, it's 32. Sorry, 30, 35, verse... Uh, oh, no, it's 32, sorry. Sorry, it is right. You were right. 32, verse verse 5. Go ahead and read that again. Okay. Psalms 35, verse 5. 30, 32, verse 5. Sorry, 32. Psalm 32, verse 5. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. For this shall every one that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayst be found, surely in the flood of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. Amen. So I want you to, I want you to notice something in here. So when we look at that, Psalms, Psalms 32, verse 5, David makes a statement. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you. And then he says, and I did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now, David uses three words there, Can, and, and they're, they're, I want you to, to just note them. So what are the three words in that first part that you're noticing? David makes a statement about a condition in his life. What are the three words that are key in there? What 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 is he saying? So, so just say them as you as you see them, and just let, let just speak them out. We're okay. So he acknowledges, but what's he acknowledging? Sin. So he uses the word sin. Okay. What else? What's another word? Sorry. Transgression, and Joel, you said iniquity. Now David says three things. He says that he, he, he did not cover his, his sin, and he talks about, he acknowledges his iniquities and his transgression. Now, that's not a mistake. David's, David's not just talking to be kind of flower, to, like to throw flowers here and to sound all important. David's not saying, so I decided to go to the washroom, the bathroom, the restroom, the loo. That's not what David was doing. It wasn't looking for different words to say the same thing. David was being very specific and precise in this. And if you look it up, you see in the concordance something very important. Now, here's my question to you. What does the word sin mean to you? Ah, we're, we're, we're in a, this is a different service today. Pardon? Okay, so missing the mark. Somebody else? Sword of glory of the Lord, okay. Go ahead. Anything against God, okay, over here? Separate from God, okay. All right, let's, we're just, there's, I'm not looking for right or wrong right now. I just want to know what you think. What's that? D 
doing things against God's way, okay. What about transgression then? If, if, you, if that's what you believe about sin, what's transgression mean? Somebody tell me what you think transgression means. Something against God. Something against God. the same thing. Okay. Do you agree with that? Okay. And remember, I said there's a reason why David used all three. It's really making you think, isn't it? I can see the wheels grinding over here. She's like, hmm, I don't know if I should say something. <laughs> okay, so trespass. What about iniquity? What do we do when we look at the word iniquity? What's, what's that mean then? Pardon? It's like sin, okay. She, iniquity, you said sins of the Father, okay. Going against the Lord, okay. This is why I'm teaching on this today. There's a difference, and we need to understand what that difference is. It's all in the same family, okay? If I look at it, in my household, there is Joel, Miguel, Neam, and Maxim, and they're all brothers. They are not the same person, but they are of the same bloodline. They are of the same family. They have a specific attribute, each of them. Each one of my boys are very, very much unique, although they are very similar. So... I want to explain something to you and hopefully it helps you understand some things in the word as you read it too and as you understand our responsibility. So the word transgress. So when you take the word transgress, if you got a pencil or pen, you may want to write this down. If you got a phone, you may want to start typing in notes, use them for something good, I don't know. <laughs> but transgression, let me read you what the word transgression means in the concordance, okay? A transgression is to offend. It's an offense. Think about that. It can be an offense against the Holy Spirit. It can be an offense potentially against your brother, your sister. It's an offense. It's to rebel. It's to break away from to separate yourself from, to, to break off from. A quarrel, a revolt. Now these are some of the words that we, we bring in the, in the concordance, that the concordance lays out about the, word trans, uh, about the word transgress. So a transgression. So when we see this, and David is, is talking about some things, we're going to kind of look at this. So I'm going to go to Psalms again. Psalms 20, uh, sorry, Psalms 32. Just pull this up here. And I want you to kind of read this with a different set of eyes. So Psalms 32, again in verse 5. So I'm going to read it again. And I want you to listen. So David says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sins to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my rebellion, my offense. The fact, O oh God, that I have broken away at times from you and that I have revolted. And we're going to begin to read this as you begin to understand what David's saying here. We're going to go into some other scriptures after, but I want you to understand these words. So this transgression is an offense. It's a rebellion. It is a breaking away from the Spirit of the Lord. It is a quarrel. It is a revolt. So now let's look at the word sin. This is the word sin. In the concordance, to properly miss, to miss. Hence, figuratively and generally, to sin. So, by influence, to forfeit, lack, to, it's, it, it talks about the need for repentance, to lead astray. When you lead somebody astray, it's a sin. When we, it says, we bear the blame. We need to be cleansed. It talks about, it's a loss, it's a miss. We need to be purified. There needs to be reconciliation. Now, think about this. So here's David. David again. Now, as I read this scripture, David says, I acknowledge the fact, O oh God, that I have been influenced 
that I have influenced others against you. I acknowledge, O oh God, that I have forfeited. Sound a lot like Adam? That I have forfeited your things for me. I, I, Lord, I, I'm, I acknowledge that I have been led astray and that without you I am condemned and I need to be cleansed. I acknowledge that I am at fault. I have lost. I have missed. And I acknowledge this to you. And my iniquities I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my offense, my rebellion, and my breaking away, my quarrel, my revolt. Now, we know now that sin is this missing of the mark, and we know that it's, it's this forfeiting. My sister this morning was talking about an inheritance that we have in, in Jesus Christ, that we have an inheritance that there is a blessing that has been given to us in Christ Jesus. That blessing is not just for the Jews, because I pointed out in John where, where Jesus said, I have another flock that I need to, to, to bring to make one. They, he wanted to take what was two flocks and make them one. He wanted both the Jews and the Gentiles to experience his goodness and to know him for who he is. Understand? She said, we have an inheritance but so often because of sin in our life, we, Lord, we miss our mark. There is a mark, a standard, and the standard is to be like Him. The standard is to walk in holiness, to walk in truth, and to walk in righteousness. And we miss the mark of the character and the nature of God, and we stand condemned, and we need to be reconciled to him. But how did we get there? Like David said, because I have trespassed. I have been rebellious. Hmm? I have offended. I have broken away from your spirit. Sister Kathy said, you got to spend time with the Lord. I know this. Look, it's not just you that finds it challenging. It's challenging for Pastor Jean-Claude too at times in the busyness of life and everything that's going on. Everything's pulling at you. But you, if you break away from the presence of the Lord, you will trespass. You are trespassing. You are you, When you find yourself on the outside of the things of God and the presence of God, you are in a place. The Bible says there is no condemnation to those. Now David said, now look, it says when we talk about sin, it says that we, we bear blame. When you're condemned... It's because you've been found guilty, so you bear the blame. And the Word of God says there is no condemnation, no condemning you. you are, there's, you're not found guilty. There is no condemnation to those where? Outside of? No. Is it outside? Does it say outside of Christ Jesus? It says in Christ Jesus. When you abide in Him, you are not condemned. Listen to me. You're not condemned. So now we need to look at this word iniquity. The word iniquity says, I like this, it says, it's to crook. In other words, it's a bend. Something is bent that should be straight. Something that should be straight has been made crooked. There's a crook. And it says, literally or figuratively, that's what it means. It says it's also translated to do, so it's a miss, to bow down, to make crooked, to commit iniquity, to pervert. Perverse, it talks about to, to do wickedly, to do wrong. When we talk about iniquities, I'm going to give you some examples of some things. There are people who trespass. There are people that will, will act out of a place of rebellion. There's sin in our life 
they had sin offerings and trespass offerings and off offerings that they like sacrifices that they gave in the Old Testament. I want to give you an example. The law says that the speed limit is what? On the main highway. What's the speed limit here? 100. Mm. Somebody raise your hands in here if you always drive 100. Please raise your hand. Come on, all, all you good Christians, raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. Can somebody explain to me why it's so difficult for you to drive 100? So, please, I want to hear good explanation. Somebody. That's your explanation. Do you know what? Go over here. Yes. Start to slow down. So, so sometimes there's a shake in your life. Mm. Yeah, you know, some of you wonder why God shakes up your world. Amen. Some of you wonder why God shakes your world. He slows you down. Amen. Okay. So. Keep that one in your mind, okay? Now, what ha have you ever been talking to somebody or listening to music in your car, and you were driving the speed limit, you were driving 100 kilometers an hour, and then you're going, oh, Lord, God, I thank you. you. All of a sudden, you got a piece, there's a musical part that comes on, and you're like, you know, you know, people of every nation and tongue, right? Right? And we're like going, from generation to generation, we worship you. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you. Oh, for who you are. And then you look up and you see the red light and the blue light in, the, in, in your mirror and you go, oh, and then you pull over and... And the officer walks up, knocks on the window. He comes like this. He walks over. And, you know, sorry, you know, he says, ma'am, are you okay? And you're like, oh, I'm sorry, officer. I was just worshiping Jesus. <laughs> and they're going, you were doing something, but I, I don't know what you were doing, but you were definitely doing 140, you know. And they start writing out a fine for you. Okay? What's the law say the speed limit is? The law says it's 100. But you were driving 140. But truthfully speaking, or maybe 120, truthfully speaking, you did not have an intention to break the law. That wasn't what you intended to do. You were not paying attention to the law, but you did not intend to break the law, but it doesn't change the fact that you did. Right? Right? So... Sin can be present in our life even sometimes when we're not aware or our intention hasn't been to sin. Sometimes we sin simply because we are flawed in our thinking. Maybe, maybe just in, we, we, we have not been taught something, but we, we have sin. But you see, underneath of the law, it didn't matter. You were still guilty. Here's your fine. Do it again, and we'll take away your license. You were guilty. So underneath of the law that determined whether or not you could come into the holiness of, of God, if you sinned, you could not come in. You couldn't come into his, his holiness because sin separated you from him. So Jesus Christ came as a perpetual sin offering for you and I. In other words, one that was always going to be offered. Now here's the thing, transgressions, okay? Here's a transgression. Let me give you a really good idea or a good example of transgression. I told my boys once, I said, I used to tell them, boys, I want you to eat healthy and all this, we told him anyway. So the bus driver decided this one day that he was going to give my children chocolate Easter bunnies. Come on up, come on up here. Come on up, come on, come right down in the front. That's right. A, yeah, he says, really? And we got, I'll go get you. I will. <laughs> Just, it's good to see you. I'm sorry. Come on. Pastor Jean-Claude, your name is? 
Daniel, pleasure to meet you, Daniel. So the bus driver said to my children, you know, here's your, he gave them this gift. I don't know actually what he said, but he gave them this chocolate Easter bunny. And from the bottom of the hill, and I'm telling you, their school was at, they had the shortest drive to school ever because it was literally, the school's at the bottom of the hill and our house was at the top of the hill. You could see our driveway if you looked hard enough. I mean, it was just a hill. And it was long hill, but you could see, I mean, they could have walked to school. And by the time the bus stopped at our house, this guy here had the feet left on that chocolate Easter bunny. Because he knew that if he brought the chocolate Easter bunny home, dad was probably going to put it up somewhere and he'd get little pieces. He stuffed that Easter bunny in his mouth. I mean, he went, let's start with the ear. <laughs> I don't even know how you enjoy that. He didn't even enjoy it. By the way, by the way, when we're busy sinning, we only think we're enjoying things. We might enjoy it immensely, but you're going to get a bellyache, I'm going to tell you. Right? And so we're there, and my boy's going, <laughs> he got down, the little feet of the Easter Bunny was like this, and I was not happy. Well, I can't call that particular action a sin that he wasn't aware of, can I? Why can't I say that? Because he knew what he was doing. He was being rebellious. He had made up his mind I want to do what I want to do this time, or I know I shouldn't. How many of you ever did that in your own life? You go, um, this lady over here, what's your name? Linda. Pardon? Linda. Linda. So Linda goes into the store, she goes, oh, I really shouldn't buy that dress. <laughs> <laughs> oh! Get behind me, Satan, you know? There's a story of, of, of a lady, and, and her husband said, she got after her husband. She said, honey, you've got to stop spending the money. But I just, I just bought a chain. Stop spending the money. We're tight. And he said, oh, but no, we got to be tight. So she, he said, okay. She said, give me your credit card. So he gave her the credit card. And so she went to the store. And when she was in the store, she walked past and she's seen this beautiful dress in the window, and she said, I'll call this lady Sister Linda. <laughs> and he said, oh. She walked past the window, and she came back because the dress called her name. <laughs> How did you know my name? <laughs> Have we met before? Oh. And so she bought the dress, and she took it home, but she hid it from her husband. She didn't want, because it's true, she didn't, want, she didn't want her husband to, to know that she bought the dress. Actually, this is based on a true story, I'm telling you. So anyway, she bought the dress and anyway, put, that, put it away and hid it from her husband. And so her, finally her husband found out when the bills came in. And he said, I thought you told me not to be spending money. Why did you buy this dress? She said, I couldn't help it, honey. I was tempted. He said, then you tell the devil, Satan, get behind me. She said, I did. And the husband said, what happened? He went behind me and told me it looked good there too. <laughs> you know, when we, when we want to do what we want to do, We'll find a way to do it. We'll find, we'll find some excuse that, that justifies why we want to do this. And we'll twist and we'll bend things and we'll, we'll take them out of shape and context and, and we'll go, well, God wants me. I'm a child of the king and he wants me to look like a princess. Except for that you can't pay your hydro bill. Tell that to hydro. God, you know, we also have a responsibility. Right? We, the, like, we have to be good stewards. So when we do knowingly, when we do what is wrong, it's a trespass. So David starts to read a little differently here. And then there's iniquity. Here's what iniquity is. And it breaks my heart. Because see, iniquity talks about a bend. For those of you just coming in, sin is sin can mean your life. It means to miss the mark, okay? 
So to miss a standard, well, what's that standard? Well, we're talking about the standard that God has. He wants us to, to walk in purity. He wants us to experience the joy. He wants us to, to uh, of, of living a different life. But we try to obtain this and we miss it. Like, we're just, we're human, right? But you can miss the mark without even knowing. Right? You can, you can make a mistake. You ever wrote a math test before? I've made some mistakes. I thought a four was a six, you know, and, and messed it up. It was, it was honestly a mistake. I got the wrong answer. It doesn't change the fact it was still the wrong answer. I lost the marks. So sin in our life, we miss a mark sometimes just simply because Jesus came for that too. And then we have the second part, which is a trespass, or this where we, where we knowingly make a choice to be rebellious or to break away from the Lord, to quarrel with others or with the Holy Spirit because we want to do something that deep inside we know. And sometimes it's not so deep inside. It's pretty obvious we shouldn't do, but we want to do it anyway. So now we have iniquity. What's iniquity? Well, iniquity is a bend. What's that? Okay. Well, Sin is immoral, can be immoral, trespasses. I mean, it's, the bottom line, it's, all this, it's, it's falling in the same pan. But here's the thing. There are a lot of people that like the sin they're in. So they just keep doing it over and over again. And what they say is, Jesus forgives me. Iniquity. Iniquity trespass we've premeditated it we have thought about it and we've decided we're going to do it and we figured out how we're going to do it when david slept with bathsheba he trespassed he absolutely sinned and trespassed he knew what he was doing and the punishment was hard the consequences were heavy but there are those who know what they're doing is wrong they're, they have been shared truth. They understand. Now, I'm not talking about people that don't understand because they don't know. But there are those who understand that what they do is wrong. They say, well, nobody's perfect. We have a term for that in English that we use. And this is how prevalent it is in our culture and in our church world. We say, guilty pleasures. Hello? Hello? A guilty pleasure. And iniquity speaks of a bend in our life. A way that we have gone crooked and we maintain the crooked path. You see, now this is no longer premeditated. This is a lifestyle. Iniquity is a perpetual sin in your life. It is something that you continue to maintain. I'm going to tell you something. You may sin and you may, you may trespass gossiping about somebody, but I'm going to tell you it's probably iniquity in your life. Because I doubt if you're a gossiper, you're only doing it every blue moon. You very likely have a problem talking about everybody, everything, and everybody else's things. It's a way of life, even though the Word tells us, stop it's one of the things God hates. Think about that. It's a way of life. There are people that look at, for instance, I know people. That they, it's a constant issue with sexual immorality in their life. Remember I told a person once, they came to church and I was talking to them and anyway, they give their heart to Jesus. They cried at the altar. And so the Lord is just dealing with sin in their life and they're realizing that they've missed the mark and they're saying, God, just forgive me. But then, boom, oh, I, brother, I fell. Okay? We need to pray and confess your sins, your trespasses. But what are you going to do about it? Well, brother, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I know you understand that God has something more for you. He wants you to go beyond this point. He is your strength. He didn't say you wouldn't be tempted, but he is your strength. And so, 
oh, and then the next thing you know, he's sleeping with this one, and he's sleeping with that one, and sleeping with this one. And well, I'm witnessing to them. I'm telling them about Jesus. What Jesus are you serving? Because they don't want your Jesus because he doesn't seem to be strong enough for you to do what is right to do. So why on earth would they want him? Well, in honor, I remember one day he walked in the church and fell down at the altar and he was crying again. And, and notice, and I'm playing the piano and the Spirit of the Lord came heavy like that, boom, on me. And I looked across at him and I went, oh dear God, please. Because I heard a word in my spirit. I said to him, the Lord would say to you this. You are at a crossroad. You're going to make a decision. Or a decision is going to be made for you. You're not going to be able to stop some things from like basically occurring. I'm giving you the paraphrase of this, but I'm telling you approximately what it was. And I told him, where you have been, where you'll go, will seem like a stroll in the park to where you've been if you don't listen and you don't surrender if you don't stop this rebellion. Well, next thing I knew, police were involved. Next thing I knew, he was shipped away. He was detained and serving prison time. The Spirit of the Lord tried to speak to him, but there was a bend, there was an iniquity. Now let me read this to you again. I want you to understand something as we go through. Psalm 32, verse 5 again says, David says, I acknowledge that I've missed the mark, God. Whether on purpose or not, I realize I've missed it. And I said, I will confess the times that I have been rebellious and I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And you forgave the bend that I had in me the crooked path that was in me because of my sins. See, sin will always take you further than you want to go. It's important to have the heart and the desire of the Lord within us because there is no part of this that we can just say, well, it's not as bad as the guy who keeps on sinning. I, you know, you need Jesus. We need Jesus. And David says, for this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. We live in a day and an age in a time where the world around us needs to see men and women of God. I have a term I use and I talk to the youth sometimes and I say, don't be Christianized. Stop learning to be hypocrites. Don't go out and people come to church and we teach them, we, we, we get them all dressed up on the outside, we get them washed up, we, we teach them all the right things to say, and the, whenever, whenever I say hallelujah, everybody goes, hallelujah, you know, whenever I say, if I say God is good, the church better say, all the time, it's, it's nice and it's fun, but listen, we're, it's time to stop teaching people to be churched, and it's time to start having the heart of God. It's time to teach people the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's time that people aren't worried about the outside so much. They're like, God, inside of me, I am, I'm, I'm feeling condemned. What is wrong? And the sister beside them says, well, there's no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. Are you in Jesus right now? Well, I've given him my heart. Well, come on, let's go spend some time in Jesus' presence. And let's just, let's just hear how much he loves you. But, but sister, I'm wrestling with this. Yes, I know. But God says that when you're weak, he is strong. He didn't say that when you're weak, that, that suddenly you'll poof magically be strong. But he's in you, so because he's strong, he'll carry you. You can be strong, but let's pray together. Let's thank him. Let's give him the glory. Let's learn how to be like Jesus. Amen? Let's stop churching people. Let's stop making factory cookie cutter hypocrites and let's start discipling people what did he say he said go out into the world and make what say it again make what 
You can't make disciples out of people if you yourself don't know what discipleship is. You need to get educated. You need to get educated in the heart of God. Now, here's the thing. I want to read some scriptures to you, okay? So, can we go in our Bibles? I'm going to take you over to John, 1 John. I want to read something. It says, verse John chapter 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, it's 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to read from there. It says, Therefore the world does not know us, because it does not know him. Listen, you're actually not in a bad place if people are looking at you and saying, Who are you? I don't know you anymore. When the people that you hang around with or that went to school with you or or in the community, they say, who are you and what have you done with this person? Like, that's not a bad thing. Because the Bible says that the world does not know us because they don't know him, capital H. They don't know know God. They don't know Jesus. So when we're living a godly life, we should actually be sticking out like a sore thumb. The problem is, is in the modern church world, we don't want to stand out like a sore thumb. We don't like feeling pressure. But we all clap when our brothers are being killed in parts of Africa, and our sisters are being killed in parts of Africa. When they're being killed in China, they're being killed in Egypt, and we, we commend them for their heroic acts, and yet I'm so glad somebody else is willing to pay the price and stick out like a sore thumb, just not me. Is, is that not true? Am I, uh, sorry, am I being, am I being, are you, are you angry with me right now? Listen, if the worst thing you and I have to face in Canada is that somebody may not like us because we stand up for Jesus Christ, get over yourself, sweetheart. That's really harsh to say, but I'm talking, listen, I had a young man, he came to me, and uh, my son knows this is true, and, and I love him a lot. He's one of my students, and I just love him, and I believe God is working in his life. And he said, JC, would I be able to borrow your truck? And, 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 you know, and I was thinking about, would it be possible? I said, it might be possible. Let me check with my wife. And I was thinking about it, and I said, I think it should be okay. And something, there's a check in my spirit, the Holy Spirit, just something like that. He's, he's a wonderful guy. He'd never do anything uh, to harm anything that he got from us. And I said, what do you need for? He says, it's a wedding. So I said, oh, I said, your sister's getting married. And my son said, yeah, so I said, Amanda, and he said, no, he says, my other sister, and so I didn't think anything of it, and then as he left, my son said, yeah, dad, his sister is getting married to another woman. He's the best man, and he's going to be chauffeuring her around in, my, in, in what would be my truck, right? And the Spirit of the Lord just really convicted me inside it, and I finally sat down with him, and I said, you know, I said, Derek, I, I love you, man. I love you. And I said, I actually, I, I have, I love your sister. But I said, but I do not love what is wrong. And I told somebody, I said, yes, Jesus loves you, but he doesn't love the mess he finds you in. Separate it, please. Stop making excuse for the mess in your life and the mess in other people's lives. Called sin, trespasses, and iniquity. Stop justifying what is creating a bend in society. The iniquities of the fathers that went down, it it makes sense now when you think about that scripture. It says the bend in their thinking got passed to the children who passed it to their children who gave it to their children. And our job as people, as men and women of God, is to fix, to make straight the crooked Straighten out the bend. and Stop letting the devil keep people in prison in iniquity. We have a responsibility to be a light on a hill. That's what we have. We, you know what? I've never seen light go around a corner. It might get bounced, but light travels in a straight line. You're on the hill. That light's coming in a straight line to whoever's seen it. 
parts of that light is a straight line right to them. We're not called to have a bend. We are called to be straight and to be visible. People need to know what straight looks like. It's a, word. It's a, it's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Think about that. So he says, Behold now, we are children of God, and it is not yet been revealed that we shall, uh, sorry, what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. If you have hope in Jesus Christ, I hear people say, I have hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they quote scriptures. Well, here it says, if you have hope, you, pure your, you purify yourself just as he is pure. Did you hear me? You stop making excuses for sin in your life, trespasses and iniquities. You get down to the business because you have hope in Jesus. You get down to the business of getting things straightened out. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know what lawlessness we're talking about? It's an offense, it's a rebellion to the law that God has laid out. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Okay, let me... Let me be careful on this because people say, you see, GC, Pastor GC, in him there's no sin. So once you're a Christian, you can't sin anymore. No, 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 no. And I'm, I'm telling you, yes, there is grace and mercy out there, but if you're going to preach the message of grace, you better preach the whole message. Stop preaching the part that makes you feel warm and fuzzy. Because grace, grace beckons you, challenges you, and equips you to go beyond that place in your life. You get past it. I don't want to serve a Jesus that the only thing I can do is stay in my place of sin till he comes pretending that it's not there. You see, I have a coach and he trains me. I, I do powerlifting. Yes, by the way, Pastor JC does powerlifting. I know I don't look like much, but anyway. So I got into the gym and I started lifting and he said, you, he said, I want to see you start increasing your weight. He said, you, 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 need to, you should be going up between 5 and 10 pounds a week. I said, are you kidding me, man? You trying to kill me? He's like, you know, but I was excited about it, though. But he worked, and for the longest time, he wouldn't let me lift too much for about a month, and then it started to go through. And I'm not saying this to brag, but as I was working with him, I started off doing deadlifts. I think it was around the 200 mark, 200-pound deadlifts. And then all of a sudden, it was 210, 215, 225. Well, the last time I was in the gym, my deadlifts were 200 and, or sorry, 355 pounds. That's my deadlift at 355 pounds. It means I can squat down like this, grab you, and lift you up off the floor as long as you're underneath the 355 pounds, and I can do that 10 times. You think about that. My squats went from being 100 and something to I squat 305 pounds. That means I can put you on my shoulders, go down to the floor with you like this. My bum just about touched the floor and come back up again. And I can do that at least 10 times, and I don't know you're there. That's where I am now. Do you think, though, I would still have him as a trainer if he told me, well, I know you want to lift, and I know that you're here to get some weights, and but you'll probably always stay exactly the way you are. Why do we expect that in the church when we serve Jesus, that somehow the sin in our life should just stay there, untouched, unchanged? We just make excuses for it. When are we going to realize that, yes, God shows us mercy. He shows us, his, he says, look, you know, sister, you deserve punishment. The devil is, is your accuser. You deserve punishment, and he's got a real strong case against you. But I heard you call out for Jesus. I heard you call out for me. So I'm going to show you mercy, and I'm going to take the devil's case away from him so, so it gets thrown out of court in front of the, the, the judge, my father. And in the meantime, while I have shown you mercy, 
I am going to now give you grace, which is strength. I'm going to give you strength, not excuses, strength to become greater than this in your life so that you can move on past this point and have victory and authority over the works of the enemy. That's the Jesus I want to serve. I don't want to stay the same as I was yesterday. I want to be different. And yes, along the way of learning to lift those weights, my coach, I'd feel so proud of myself. I'm like, hey, look, I can squat 295. And he goes, lower your weight. I'm like, why? He goes, you're not lifting right. You're going to hurt yourself. And I'm like, okay, he's lower the weight. And I'm like, oh, take some weight off. And he goes, now let me see your form. And I do. He goes, not bad. We need to work on this for another two weeks. What? You know, we're working on it for another couple of weeks. We're working on it for another couple of weeks. And then he let my weight go up. Sometimes we have a stumble along the way. But if we'll listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit and his coaching, we will get better form in our Christianity and we will get stronger in our faith and in our victories. They will become more and more and more every day. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in this world. Brother, nothing you will ever face in your life is stronger than Jesus Christ. It might be stronger than you right now in some places, but I want to encourage you, the God that loves you, formed you, made you, and I pray that you serve, will take you beyond what stands in your way now. Because that's his faithfulness. That's his, that's his goodness to you. That's his promise. And so I want to tell you, you know, one thing I learned, people get mad. They say, brother, the si oh, the temptation is so heavy. Okay. I want you to think about something. Do you know what my coach does with me whenever I get used to the weight? It's always heavy when I lift. Always. I never go to the gym. You don't lift 305 pounds and it's suddenly light. It's always heavy. It's just I'm surprised I can lift it. I'm like, wow, wow, I can do that now. And when I can do that really well, he puts more on. And then I struggle again. But you see, I've got you. Something happened inside of me in my brain. Something clicked. And in my body, something clicked and said, struggle isn't always bad. Ooh, struggle means I get to win. And I get to get excited because in a month from now, in two weeks from now, I will be victorious over 305 pounds. And I will be pushing up 310. Woohoo! And I get excited about the struggle that's in me because how can I not? Because I'm getting stronger. And if you know the God you serve, when you come face to face with temptation in your life, with difficult situations in your life, you will get excited in the God who stands before you and with you and in you because you will get stronger and you will look forward to the victory, not at the present thing that stands in your face. Are you with me this morning? Do you hear my heart this morning? God wants you to know that you have power. Do I have a little more time? Do I? A little? Okay. Look back at the clock. I'll finish. I won't be too, too much longer. I know it's been a long service. So I want to read you this. It says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. This is in John John chapter 14, verse 20, 23, it says, if, it says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we, and sorry, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Hallelujah. He says, He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear is not mine. But the Father who sent me, these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. Now, listen to me. Some of us need to really pray like David and say, Search my heart, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Some of us need to pray and say, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. 
we need to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Because it, I'm telling you, I'm just being honest, even in Pastor JC's life, when there's an area where I'm not keeping the word of the Lord present and before me, it's because I don't love him enough. I don't really understand his love for me, and I have not learned to love him. I'm telling you. I love my wife. Try and mess with her. You're going to find out that I've got a nasty side. You better, you better know Jesus really well. Because this six foot two pastor is coming after you. Don't touch my wife and don't touch my kids. My wife loves me. And I love her. I want to be with her. And she wants to be with me. And I don't let anything come between us. And if it tries to get between us, you're in trouble. I had a young... That always blows my mind. This young 24, 27-year-old girl walking down the hallways. I'm 43 years old. 43. Yeah, no, I look older than that. Don't say. Anyway, 43 years old. I saw the look. She's looking going, it's hard to judge with you white guys, you know. I have you know my mama's black, okay? So just give me a break, all right? <laughs> Linda, Linda, Linda. <laughs> Listen to me, Linda. Okay? All right. <laughs> Where was I, Joe? <laughs> so this 24-year-old, she come over, 24, and she said, she, she told me, she didn't even, even make any bones about it. She told me she'd have an affair with me. I'm a teacher at school. I turned and basically looked at her and said, girl, I don't need a girl. I got a woman at home. Thank you. I did. I shot that down. I marched up to the office. I went to the director of the school. And I said, you need to cut a hole in my door. I want a window in that door this week. She said, it'll be done today. They cut a hole in my door. They stuck a window in. And the janitor was mad at me because he said, why do you need it so fast? I said, because if she comes in my door for counseling, everybody's going to see who's in that room and where I'm sitting. I moved my stuff around the room. I made sure that I could be seen at all times from any angle that somebody walked out. And when she came to my office, the door got open and I said, you ain't got anything that private that we need to talk about. I'll get you another counselor. Listen to me. Amen? Sometimes the temptation, the temptation might be great, but the victory is equally great and greater. And Jesus said, you know, if you love me, you're going to keep my words. Because those are the words of my father. And if I love him like I, I love my wife, there was no way I was letting this little thing come between her and me. Are you kidding me? Momentary pleasure for what? For what? How short-sighted can we be? And I'm going to promise you something. As a children of God, we're short-sighted. Some, I mean, the children of Israel, I don't get it. God's people have been doing this for thousands of years. We, they, the God of Abraham parted the water, and like I mean, imagine you, you imagine this room being water, and you go, "Oh man, oh look at that little Jay over there has got his forty-five and is going to shoot me." Oh boys, what am I going to do? Jesus, you got to do something. And then imagine if you were standing in the you were here. Let's let's make this more realistic to you in Toronto then. Little Jay's got the 45. He's coming after you. And you stand and all the traffic is backed up for like miles and miles and miles. And, and you're going, God, he's going to kill me. And then all of a sudden all the cars go. And you walk across. And as you're walking across the traffic, all the cars close up behind you. And then little Jay, he sees that you're getting farther away. And he pulls out his gun. He goes to shoot and it goes click, 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 click. And then you get to the other side and say, Oh God, if you were any type of God in real, you'd have at least provided me with a motorcycle. <laughs> What's the matter with us? The children of Israel part, walked across the, 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 the bottom of the, like the water. He parted the Red Sea, and they got to the other side, and they said, and God drowned Pharaoh and the army, and then they turned around and go, Did you bring us out here to die, Moses? We were better back in Egypt. <laughs> God kept showing his goodness to his children. He, he, 
mean they woke up every day. There was, there was miracle bread on the ground. Exactly the amount they needed. I can't even do that with a grocery list from my wife. I go to the grocery store and come back with either too much or not enough. And there it is on the ground, everything they needed. They pick it up, they eat it, they were in great health. The Bible says their shoes didn't even wear out. Their sandals didn't wear out. And what did they do? You know, if you were any kind of God, you'd give us some meat to eat. <laughs> and unlike one of those shirts that are made out of camel hair. I don't know. But, you know, it was never enough. And I guess what I'm trying to say to you, even though it's comical, is, is why do we keep looking at sin in our life like it's got something to give us? We settle for a momentary pleasure when God has been continually showing his faithfulness to us, shift your attention. Get your eyes under the right thing. And you will realize that when you are weak, that actually he'll make you strong. You will realize that, when, that, that there's a reason why the poor can say, I am rich. Because look at, I got something you all don't have. Would you like it? I got Jesus. You, man, I can dance in my situation. I don't know. He might make me a millionaire. I don't really care. I got Jesus. And he's good to me. Something changes inside of us. Our perspective shifts and we begin to realize the greatness of the God that we serve. We stop putting him in a box and we start appreciating him and loving him for who he is. And we love him, we keep his word. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you the things and bring you, listen to this, he will bring you to, to, to sorry, bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled and neither let it be afraid. In verse chapter 15 it says I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes. Listen, he prunes why? That it may bear more fruit. God wants to cut the sin away in your life so you can start bearing fruit. More of it. It's not that you won't bear fruit, but you will not bear the caliber and the quality of fruit that you could bear if you're holding back. It's time to let Jesus, he who starts a good work, is just and faithful to carry it through to the end. It's time to let him finish. It's time to let him do what he wants to do with you. I'll leave you with this because there's so much I could, I realize I could keep talking about this for a long time. But here's the thing. In your life, there is going to be sin. There's going to be times you're going to make mistakes. You just didn't know. I didn't know. And there are times that we're just rebellious and we trespass against God. We just plan to do what we want to do. I'm going to warn you. Stop it. Because it'll lead you to a place where you have a bend and it becomes an iniquity in your life. And when it becomes an iniquity, when something is bent, I've learned that usually when we try to bend it back, it usually breaks. Or it takes a lot of force. Or it's weaker at that point. For a while, anyway. I know people that had bones that healed crooked and the only way to fix them were to break them again and reset them straight. Don't let the enemy fool you into thinking that it's okay. Jesus loves you, yes. But the Bible says, and I'm just going to refer to it, it says, it says in, in Romans, how, it says, the grace abounds, but, but if, we, if we understand what Jesus has done, how then can we go on sinning? How can we still keep sinning? How can we do this? Stop it. Be different. So here's my challenge to you. Don't condemn people. It's not what this is about. It's not a message of condemnation. Don't walk around saying, well, I can't wait to go out and tell my brother what Pastor Jay-Z said today. You got transgressions. Check yourself. Yeah. But I want you to understand something that if you want to see God move in your life with, and you want to have power and authority, then let's become a people of God who love him. Let's walk in purity. Let's walk in his word. Let, let's, 
live by his standard. Let us not make excuses for the things in our life that need to change. Where there is an iniquity, say, God, set this straight in my life. Lord, I give you permission. Where there is a transgression, you know you're just stubborn and you're choosing to do some things, then you need to humble yourself like David and say, I confess my trespasses, my transgressions before you. Lord God, would you just heal me? And Lord, I submit this stubbornness to you. And Lord, just put in me a submissive heart. Renew a right spirit in me. And where sin has happened and it gets pointed out to you and you go, oh, I'm sorry, I wow, I have offended the Holy Spirit or I have offended you. Lord God, just forgive me. He is faithful. But move past that point. Stop. Let's stop being baby Christians. And let's grow up and start eating 